Thank you all for coming. Um, I'm going to go first and say a few words about Erica and um, some worries in Alaska. Um, and I'm going to hear about the um, first I heard about the Seattle storm was that my son said it's a little windy in Seattle tonight. That was Saturday. Uh, and I said, I didn't think much of it. I saw the headlines. Anyway, Jeff and Corey will be talking about that in a second half. Okay, these are the. Uh, and at the end, I have a bit to say about uh, some sea level pressure spill scores from WPC for Alaska. And also, uh, I don't think the Alaskan forecasters will be sleeping easy at night for a while. Okay, Erica, this is what uh, came out Saturday. American, the remnants of Erica Special. All coastal watches and warnings have discontinued. Uh, they still said you should, the remnant, they were still concerned about possible rain from the remnants of Erica. And, and so the forecast valid at 18Z that day, this is at uh, 13Z, was that the storm would be dissipated. Well, this was on Wednesday, last Thursday we discussed this, and this was the track. This is actually the track that Erica actually took. You can see it never reached uh, hurricane strength, and it went here along the southern edge of the islands, Hispaniola, and died out and dissipated over Cuba. This is a forecast that we talked about uh, last week on the uh, MAG 27th, and you can see the storm. This is its position on Thursday, south of Puerto Rico. You see its forecast north of the uh, large islands here, testify into a hurricane off Florida. It was of considerable interest. And this was, the GF and that forecast was consistent with the traffic, more or less with the track of the GFS uh, from Thursday morning. And you can see this is the deterministic, and this is the various ensemble members. Note that some of them took it over the islands, and at least one of, the, some of these tended to dissipate the storms earlier than the other runs to the north of the island. Okay, this was a discussion Wednesday uh, that I went through. To, uh, the NAJ intensity forecast caused a little change in strength through 72 hours. That was due to some moderate uh, wind shear near Cuba. After that time, strengthen is indicated um, due to an expected more favorable upper level environment. An alternative forecast scenario supported by the GFS is that Arica weakens to a tropical wave due to the shear and interaction with the Great Antilles. Okay, so there was a, the GFS on Wednesday, this was its solution. On the 27th, we saw it was so strength moving uh, and strengthening our Florida. But this one had it dissipating after three days, which will be the 29th. And it was, but it was an outlier. You can see all the other models continued and in fact strengthen the thorn, some up to a category four. The 6C run? That's right. Uh, it's a six, valid time is 6C, so yeah. Okay. okay, and this is a track of the storms. Um, you can see most of the models, some had it over the west coast, east coast, out to sea some. And there's this lonely model here, which you can barely see, the AVM interpolated, uh, which had it essentially dying out over eastern mm -hmm. Cuba after passing near the peak of Espanola. Okay, well this, I'm going to go through some forecasts. This is a five-day forecast from the 27th at 0Z. This is what, this is 24-hour precip, uh, and these are the two observational estimates. You can see the usual popcorn type thing out in the west. You can see uh, center off North Carolina, which is mid-latitude in origin, and then showers from the remnants of Erica here on Long Florida, and then another disturbance from the mid latitudes over Texas, which has been around for a few days. And you can see the GFS and the parallel GFS both going for a hurricane off Florida. Canadians had it even stronger. Uh, and the European Center had a more moderate solution, not as intense. Okay, this is at four days. You can see the GFS and the parallel both going for weaker but long. Eastern coast. Canadians still wanted to put a hurricane there. 
and the European summer now had fairly intense rainfall along the east coast. So and, if I can share sure. one thing. In, in the past, you've noted before that you were you had concerns that like over Florida, the GFS would sometimes put precip out over the water and not the mainland. Yep. And, and it's and the, and the ops, and especially the parallel there, are very sharp coast land uh, delineation between heavy yep. precip and not. Yep. yep. Can you go back one? Okay. Okay, now this is uh, three days out. You can see both the models now have it on off the west coast of Florida, both the operational and parallel. The European Center is actually looking somewhat like what's observed, although it doesn't really just seems to be a bit of a break here, less rainfall here. The Canadian is still going for a strong storm along the east coast, uh, though I'm not sure not sure that's a middle attitude or a tropical storm. And finally, this is 24 to 48 and day and a half forecast. And I think all the models have caught on to this idea, somewhat more like the observations. Okay, and now this is, what I have here is these operational forecasts of Z and September 2nd. I just wanted to show how the GFS flip-flopped twice. This is 108 hours for it out. It had really sort of a chop, just a wave-like disturbance here over West Florida. Closed low here 106 hours earlier. And, and then by 126 five-day five day forecast, since it had a rather intense low here, off northern Florida. And you can see six days out, 150 hours, 156. And 162, this is from 26 at 6V, again, maybe a slight wave there. So you can see how it flip-flopped to a intense system and then went back to a weak system again. And these are various, this is like a four-day forecast. This is a verification up here. Maybe a slight wave here in the, in the Gulf of Mexico. This is the European Center, the GFS, and the parallel GFS. And they all have basically the right idea here. Very low, if anything, uh, near Florida, perhaps a tropical wave. 120 hours, European Center and operational had a weak close low. The yeah, parallel had a weak wave there. But if you go out to six, to six days before, both the operational, even more the parallel, had a rather intense center here, uh, actually off of Georgia. The European center had some sort of wave there. Seven days, this is when the European center still had a storm there. The operational, the parallel GFS was stronger, was the strongest of the three, and the operational had a little there. And then this is eight days out. You can see the European Center going for a strong storm off Florida. Um, and the parallel, and, and the, um, I don't have the parallel, the operation had a weak low in that area. Of course, the verification had very little. Uh, then I'll go through the verification. This is the track error. Um, you can see about this equal, this is the GFDL model, HWARF and the GFS. You can see. GFS did better, 48 to 96 hours. Uh, this is the intensity. Um, I think some, you know, the, GF, the GFDL did better out here. Uh, aviation didn't do well. If you look at the actual bias error, you see, again, as we've seen before, the GFS has a negative bias. The other models were too strong. This is HWARF versus, this is the actual track, the hurricane sim versus the various forecasts. And you can see the track is on the fr leftward fringe of the track. Most of the tracks had it north of the islands and continuing into or off uh, southeast. And this is the intensity forecast, HWARF. This is in terms of 10 meter winds. So your number of the forecast had to reach up to 100, 100 uh, knots. Um, in reality, it never intensified. Okay, I want to go through a number of tracks because I think my understanding is that they're key to it and the intensity will be up here. Purple is the H well, the aviation intensity is not here. Blue here is the um, GF, G, 
uh, GFS, operational, proposed H wall for this is the GFPL. And you can see the two hurricane models wanted to bring it north of the islands, and the GFS from the 23rd wants to bring it south, actually just a bit north of his actual track. This is on the 25th, and here we have the H wharf. This is the official track. Uh, this is a bit north of the uh, GFS track, the two hurricane models further north. Okay, 26, and this is the one where the GFS essentially dissipated it over High Hispanora. You can see the H wharf wanted to bring it up into uh, essentially hitting Miami. Okay, this is 26 at 60 now. The GFS, this is when the GFS flip-flopped, brought it north of Hispanola and kept it into Florida. Um, this is 12Z. The GFS now moving further to the east, north of the islands. And then and 12, 18Z further north. 17, switching back a little bit to the west. 12Z to the west, but still north of the big islands down there. Uh, this is at 28, along the east coast of Hispanola, but maintaining it into Florida, this time the west coast. And then now this is 28 at 12Z. Um, 28 at 18Z. Here you can see the, the aviation isn't keeping the storm going very long. The um, official track has it still going into Florida. Um, in this case, the GFS somehow managed to maintain it over Florida, maintain it into the Gulf. Okay. And at the 6Z, can she, the GFS has it die out near the uh, Florida Keys, GFPL keeping it going. The other mark, the uh, HWF having it die out. Okay. Now this is for Erica, this is for the whole storm of Erica, and you can see, according to this, our parallel model had a significant win over the operational in both track and intensity. Even though the GFS early on, beyond day five, actually had, really was the only model that said this storm is going to dissipate. And the reason is, of course, that we don't care what happened after the 29th because the storm was not there and we don't verify against the non-existent storm. Even though it's a matter of the parallel, actually in the storm would be there in the operational, at least uh, earlier forecast saying it wouldn't be. So this does not include fossil worms in other words? Yeah, yeah. It also doesn't include forecast beyond five days, but I think they're working on it. Okay, and I just wanted to go through, this is 60 on the 31st. I'm going so first sea level pressure and then 500 millibar height, which I think is interesting. There's a substantial high out here, and you can see a little, little there, some convection here around Florida. Uh, this is um, 72 hour forecast for that. You can see a closed low, weak low here over southern Florida, rain along the east coast. As Jeff was pointing out, it does seem to be right offshore. Uh, 96 well developed like, um, tropical storm off Florida. And at 126 hours, little or nothing there. Actually, it was some storm. Okay, this is a 500 millibar height, zero Z. Note the tropical, the subtropical high here. This is something that the longer range forecasts, none of the models seem to have. Only a few ensemble members had like eight days out, had this fixed uh, contour there. And you can see the, note how the flow is here, okay? Note how it changes for the next forecast. Note, is becoming more subtly. You can see it here over the Bahamas. And note that this is a weaker high further to the east. You can see in this case, again, more north when you had the strong, uh, a cyclone here. You have this more the flow like this. If you go back to the analysis, you can see how it's changed. And that subtropical high there, in 500 millibar height, has moved further to the east. And then if you go to 126 hours and there was no tropical storm forecast, you can see the high has moved further back to the west. 
So I think, you know, the models had trouble capturing this feature and therefore brought it north of the islands rather than to the south. Okay, point. The operation of GFS correctly forecast this station when no one else did. But then it backed away from this forecast. The European Center then moved towards dissipation. And our skill scores that I've shown give the GFS no credit for not forecasting the false alarm after Erica dissipated. The models seem to, uh, models it should be under forecast, the subtropical cloud moved Erica to north of the islands. Erica moved north to the south and had a greater interaction with the islands, which helped to dissipate the storm. Anybody have any other? It was a shear they talked about over Cuba, but I did not see as big a signal in that. The question is why did the GFS outperform the specialty hurricane models? Flip of a coin. I think, you think it's, you know, I think this has been too much emphasis on deterministic models and a situation that was known at forecast time was very uncertain. If you read the discussions, all we talk about how uncertain it was and just a little bit of deviation gets it shredded right now. Sure, but like none of the, in, in the various ensembles we looked at, almost none of them had that southern track. None of them were quite far south of us, but there were several ensemble members that were close to Cuba. <laughs> Yeah. So it, it passes through the Florida Straits, but close to the Cuban. Definitely not something that comes up the eastern side of Florida. So the, the ensemble influence was still too far north, but it was definitely hinted at this. And there was a good there was a good graphic floating around Twitter by Brian, I think it was Wood. I just had to pull that. No, I can't. <laughs> but that actually showed the three different three different scenarios. The one from the definitely, you know, a weaker storm that passes into the Gulf. Certainly the hurricane so center. First, first, this is another case where look at the ensembles, look at the ensembles, look at the ensembles. The term mistake is not going into the story. Second one is this is a messing issue, messaging, messaging issue. The, because, the, because the hurricane center is not adjusting their cones, their uncertainty cones, based on the uncertainty of the actual forecast. It's the same cone whether all the models are straight down the pipe or whether it's huge spread like this case. Yeah, that's on the error. The, the, the cones are based on the error from the prior year, if I'm not mistaken. It has nothing to do with the ensembles, which I feel is an unfortunate situation, actually. I, I would argue that that is a big mistake because... I would, it, too. It, it should be based on the uncertainty in the actual forecast and not just how the models did in the last three years or one year, however long their statistics are doing to determine that cone. Yeah, and then it's a matter of... There's another, there's some other ideas floating around about uh, some of the spaghetti plots where they put the statistical models on there, like some that aren't, you know, not, you know, some of them even have, I think, persistence on there. So there's, there's definitely a messaging issue here as well. Yeah. As far as, you know, people look at this and say, plus, like, no, if you actually go in and read the, techn the, the technical discussions, they knew it was uncertain, they said it was uncertain, it wasn't that bad a forecast. It still comes back to, you know, how, I don't know, if, you, if you're looking for a particular solution in an ensemble, you know, if one of one or two out of 20 members have it, I mean, obviously it's in the back of your mind it's a possibility, but it's certainly not something you would give a high probability to. Right. I'm not saying a high probability, but that uncertainty needs to be communicated to the public, and that's fair. And the, the most graphic, the graphic people are going to look at are the, is the cone graphic. Uh, sure. I'm not going to see it on there. Okay. Jordan? The definition of ensembles provides, you know, probably density and all that, that you encompass all possible yeah. okay. We were we were out a little bit outside. Yeah, it was outside the envelope for sure. The extent that you fall outside, that the extent that the ensemble is not have the right initial conditions set up or the best uh, 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 forth and during the right one for that time. I don't. So you're always going to get. An outlier if, the, if it's done right. The question is, how do you decide if that outlier is where you're going? Well, most of them turned to the right. That's why. Yeah, they all, they Not all, because of they, because it was spread. The spread was sufficient, but, but from, they didn't, most of them did, didn't develop that subtropical ridge, so it came through the subtropical high and curve recurve. The VJ would say the hurricane center was definitely aware the storm could dissipate. They would. Yeah, closely consider that. that. There was a discussion that said that specifically. Yeah, the discussions all said, you know, it's quite possible it might not survive this long. But we're going to forecast out the entire length anyway because there is 
Because at that point, there is a risk. Okay. But the actual risk wasn't all that well communicated by the end graphic. Okay. Okay, well. The question about is because they're tied to having to provide the forecast out to this level because it's required, anyway, even if it doesn't make sense. Well, I think, you know, we have to adjust. Well, the possibility is there, but it needs to be communicated better yeah. how, you know, how likely that is. Yeah. Not, not just better than better states than sorry. Yeah. Yeah. There needs to be some way to get it on the graph. Yeah. Okay. I'll keep the even in the forecast. I'll the discussion. One more to tangential it. question. How did the uh, parallel GEFS do? Oh, it was much more with the consensus, at least out in the day six range. It wanted to develop a strong hurricane more than the operation. Mm. Okay. How did the six or seven, you know, right? Back oh, last Wednesday. You're comparing the operational GEFS to the parallel GEFS? No, the operational GFS, I'm sorry. He asked about GEFS. Oh, did you? I don't know. Okay. Do we know? What was it? Very low. I haven't looked at it. Okay. It hasn't been looked at yet, Bill. In the evaluation period. Because so. yeah, uh, that, that has the current GEFS model in it at the proper resolution for the ensemble run. So it would be interesting to see what happened there. True. Okay. Um, I'd like to move on. Should I tell this quickly? Um, a couple of weeks ago, and I, I think it was the 12th or so, we discussed um, if a, there was concerns about an eight-day forecast for Alaska. There was a flip-flop between day eight and seven and a half, and we, you know, we weren't entirely sure why they were so concerned about day eight. And our carbon start of Alaska, the Alaska forecast offices, uh, told, told me a couple emails why. Um, they're supporting the uh, drilling effort in the Chuck GC. I'll show you where that is. That's north of the Bering Strait. Sorrow is drilling near the Arctic Sea ice edge. And obviously, a lot of eyes on this. It has about 30 ships there. And the low that they was forecast over the, just north of the Bering Strait got them very nervous. There's some discussion of shutting down and moving to safe harbor. Well, a few days later, he sent me another email. And he said, uh, we have our eyes on a bomb that may develop in the Bering Sea from the remnants of what is now Typhoon at Sunday. Uh, there's a lot of uncertainty, and they ra actually raised their threat level internally. Among their concerns, the President and the Secretary of State have both been in Alaska. Uh, it, was five, it was five federal government ships in the Arctic. The shell was just about ready to begin drilling in the Chuck GC. And also, of course, with any large storm, it has real coastal impacts. As we've seen on the news lately, there are several villages, or some villages at least, that will have to be moved because of the because of the receding coastline. Of course, it recedes most in an active weather situation. Okay, well, August 31st, this is the headline I found. Strong winds and high waves that pounded the northern coast of Alaska had led shell to temporarily stop oil drilling. Eastern Chukka Sea experienced gale force winds. Range of 39 to 54, I zoom miles per hour. I'm not sure. And um, there was also, at one point, they evacuated some people on the coast, uh, some oil industry workers, because the highway to that point had been uh, flooded or, or was a danger of flooding. This is a Chuck GC. And this, and this I'll try to use to orientate you in the, in the maps I'll be showing in a minute. Essentially, if, you're, if you, this is a bad straight, and if you live here, you can see Alaska from your home. Or Russia. <laughs> uh, you see, of course you can see Alaska. You can also see Russia on a good day. So, what in mouth is it? This is at center. This is where it was in the, um, I think that's the 25th, well south of Alaska. So I don't think this storm actually was directly involved, although it could have um, intensified it. Um, this is a forecast. I'm going to show you how the situation developed. This, these are the Aleutians. This is the west coast of North America. The north shore of Alaska is here. And the star indicates more or less the Bering Sea. You can see these two lows here moving in. I think they're more from Siberia. Um, this is a six hour. This is for the 12Z. 12 hours later, storms are a little bit more intense. Uh, now, on the 26th, you can see this storm is developing. 
he has, like most of the energy, has moved to the first of the two storms. And now this is on the 27th at zero Z. You can see a tight gradient forming. The chip, chip whatever you'll see there is north, is would be in this region. You can see a tight gradient here. This is 12 Z, and this is the, I'm going to look at the forecast of the specific times. You can see again the tight gradient into the north slope, not so much into the Barrett uh, Strait region. And then the low continued. Okay, this is for now, I've shifted a bit. Again, the Aleutians are here. This is the coast, the Barren Strait here, Russia, Alaska. And you can see the north slope here, north shore of Alaska here. And this is a low, very strong winds into the sea. This is a 12Z at August 27th. I'm not sure when the winds, actual near surface winds, are the strongest. But I decided to look at this. You can see a very tight gradient. I think this is 984. Okay, this is 42 hours. Not a bad, pretty good forecast, I think. Uh, 72 hours, I think you see the low shifting a bit to the east here, uh, 96 hours. And then 120 hours, you can see why they would get nervous about flip-flops. You can see the low is quite different. It's now more of an inland low. Uh, 132 hours, it's mostly over the land. The flow over the sea is quite different, although probably still quite intense. Uh, this is 162 hours. 168 hours, you can see the flip-flops here, 74. And 180 hours, so fairly intense low. So my impression is for seven and, at least seven and a half days in advance, the GFS forecast a strong low for the northern, northern coast of Alaska. Uh, the exact location of the low and where, the, of course, the dangerous winds would be, of course, moved quite a bit. Now I want to look at the skill scores for Alaska. This is uh, the, and these are the deterministic models. This is essentially for the summer in Alaska. This is something that Keith Grill set up for the Weather Prediction Center. You can see the European Center, the GFS, the Met Office, and the Canadian. And you can see about the, the deterministic models tend to reach 0.6 correlation about after day six, six and a half. Um, these are now the ensemble models. European Center, this is a GFS, Canadian blend, and this is a GEFS. You can see these tend to reach 0.6 about day 7, but still day 8 is pretty poor scores, ranging from 0.5, 6 to below 0.4. Deterministic models are shown by comparison. So these gives you a day to a half a day more predictability with the ensemble means. Okay, now this is, what I have here is the GEFS. European Center and the GFS at 12Z later. So this, even with a 12-hour advantage for the same time, the European Center Ensemble still outperforms our operational ensemble. The new one should decrease that gap. And then this is the deterministic model. So you can see here, the GFS has had a good summer, including Alaska. You can see it actually has less than a 12-hour gap with the European Center. And that day eight, they're pretty much the same. Okay, just in case you thought it was safe, uh, this is Ignacio. This is a track of it from this morning from the Weather Underground site. Deterministic GFS takes it into uh, northwest Canada. You can see the range of the ensembles. So again, this is something that will keep the Alaskan forecasters up at night worrying about it. One that just goes right into the Puget Sound there. <laughs> yeah. Right up the Strait of Juan, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you heard it here first. And then this is uh, Jimena. Uh, this is the ensembles. Um, you can see exactly one of the ensemble takes it back into the Hawaiian Islands, and there's about three that take it north to Alaska. Okay. So GFS consistently forecasts a strong near low near northern Alaska up to seven and a half days. Position varied. GFS performed well this summer. Deterministic models for Alaska skillful out to day six or six and a half. Ensembles of scope are up to day seven. So day eight forecasts are going to be problematic. Surprise, surprise. Okay, any comments or questions on the line? Any here? Yes, hey Glenn, this is Carvin. I appreciate that. Uh, I've got another call to go to, but uh, I'm a little bit late, but I really appreciate the analysis here. I, I do have some more information on that, and also with Ignacio. Uh, where you know where this the ensemble tracks and the and the main track uh, pushing things up into southeast Alaska, 
uh, even you know that's 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 a place that gets probably as much rain as any place in the United States, and we've had uh, we're well above normal right now, and we've had uh, several flood, flooding events. Uh, down in southeast Alaska, and especially in the vicinity of Sitka, where we've actually had some deaths due to flash flooding. And so uh, we'll, uh, I'd like to maybe talk with you offline, uh, I, but I appreciate this is a, a great analysis, and I'd like to share this with uh, uh, the forecast staffs here in Alaska. You're welcome to share it with them and anybody else. Um, European center plots, well, they're not really part of the Alaska partner. EC plots we're not supposed to share with anybody outside NOAA. But anything understood. Else? Okay, thank you very much. I'm, you know, it's. I hope to look more at Alaska in the future, and I'll do what I can. Thank yeah, you. we we really appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, and now for the. That was a warm up. Now for the main S. <laughs> So Jeff and I will talk about this windstorm that was in western Washington. Um, I'll be looking at the synopics of it, and Jeff will take a more mesoscale view of the Pacific wind gust forecast. Um, so this is the storm we're talking about. Here is a water vapor image from 1145Z on the 29th of August. You can see a clear cyclonic um, low sort of off the coast of Oregon. And the main theme to this presentation is there's really little predictability uh, to this event, and pretty much no more than two days predictability um, from the guidance that I examined. So just going over the synoptic setup, this is going to be um, just some GFS analysis. These plots are from Alicia Bentley um, out of Albany. On top is theta on the dynamic tropopause, which is the 2PVU surface. Um, so one of the colors are going to be your ridges, blue colors are going to be your troughs. Then in black contours is going to be low level relative vorticity that helps identify things such as um, cyclones like Asani remnants here um, and fronts. And on the bottom is just uh, 500 millibar view standard superficial heights, winds, and vorticity. Um, I circled the same features on both just to give two perspectives of this. Um, so this is four days um, in advance. Um, like I stated, there are these um, Asani remnants, which um, may have impacted um, some anastochonic wave breaking that I'll show. And then there's also this middle latitude trough of interest, which eventually becomes the short wave that affects uh, the Washington Post. So this will be your service. Any technical assistance during your call? That's done. You are the first caller to this conference. Give me your phone. Ask questions, please. Oh, yeah. 24 hours later. What if you want to Sure. Folks, we can hear someone having a conversation. Please mute. So clearly between the two, you can see uh, what's shown by the green arrow, this rig amplification and the anticyclonic wave breaking which starts to pinch this trough um, that was off the coast. 24 hours later, still, anticyclonic wave breaking continues. Again, the extent to which it's signing influence this, um, it's not perfectly clear, but it seems like it did have some impact. Um, the trough becomes increasingly cut off as the wave continues breaking, and here in the 500 millibar, Plot and see familiar uh, cutoff cyclone. And then another trough moves southeastward from the high latitudes that would eventually influence the trough off the Pacific Northwest coast. 12 to 28, this trough continues stretching out, circling in green, trough circling in red, continues moving southeastward around the periphery of the anticyclone. And then finally, these two troughs interact. Um, the southern end of that stretched out trough becomes this potent short wave, which is kicked northeastward through the trough interaction, and then it results in that strong uh, surface low. And it turns out that that interaction was uh, very hard to predict with uh, any significant lead time. So here is a analysis from uh, 12Z on the 29th of August, the time when this uh, satellite was valid. On the left is GFS, on the right is European Center. Um, I have 10 meter wind speed in the shading here in knots, and then the contours are going to be a sea level pressure in hectopascals. So just the difference in analysis between the two is uh, sort of substantial. Um, GFS had a 991 hectopascal low, and EC988 in European Center was um, pretty noticeably to the south and east of what the GFS showed. So um, this, I think, speaks to just uncertainty in general with features of the Pacific Ocean when analyses uh, differ this much. 
here is 18th June and 29th of August, six hour forecast from the European Center on the top left, uh, zero, Z, or zero hour forecast from TFS on the bottom right. On top right is some observations, some ship data and also uh, service stations. It's hard to read, uh, but there was a few observations, one of 986.8 and then another one of uh, around 990 just to its north. Um, some of these OBS have multiple um, data points for a given time and location, so this one OB had two, but again, it was near 990 hectopascals, which seems to match better with what the European Center showed at a uh, 988 close contour to northwest of Washington coast, and GFS had a little weaker pressure field. Um, then on the bottom left, just some gusts. Now, Jeff will show a better plot of wind speeds. This is for gusts ending at 18Z, and just uh, a lot of readings in the 40 knot range. So um, this storm was the deepest um, pretty much on the August record for this location um, as shown by a plot that was on Cliff Ness's blog. And the fact that there was an August um, where there's a lot of leaves on trees and also saw stated that there's some dry conditions here so the trees were not rooted uh, into the ground uh, very strongly. So these 40 knot gusts did a lot of tree damage <coughs> in the area. Corey, there's two uh, sea level pressures coming out of the GFS. Is this the uh, um, one is the relaxation one, and the other one is the uh, this is just when you put. I just know when jump back up with PMSL. I'll take it. So that's probably the old one. So it's good. Uh, you can tell it's kind of lower resolution than that. Yeah, it seems uh, smooth. Uh, the other one, MSL ET, I think it would be called. Okay. But that look more like the European Center, perhaps. All right, that'll be worth looking at. So just getting into uh, some forecast here. <clears throat> this is a 12-hour forecast. Um, top left GFS, middle NAM, bottom right EC. Uh, the GFS has sort of the weakest low, at least in this field, with a, a 992. NAM had a 990 contour EC, 988. All of them have similar wind fields. And then I have just for sort of verification, the GFS uh, analysis of 12 to the 29th. 18 hours out, I replace EC with a parallel NAM. You can see that the NAM is uh, substantially weaker than it was just in the 12-hour forecast. Um, it's good to see that the parallel NAM maintains the strength and the stronger wind field for the 18-hour forecast. 24 hours out, uh, the GFS sort of, uh, again, maintaining the low, maintaining the same sort of wind field. Um, both the NAM, I didn't show the parallel NAM here, both of them are uh, substantially weaker than when verified, and that will continue for the, for the for the forecast hour length. Again, this is just 24 hours out, so showing the low predictability source event. And even the EC at this lead time has a much a weaker low than when verified. 36 hours out, uh, you can see the GFS is now becoming more of an open trough and not a closed low. Uh, the NAM continues its uh, weak trend. And the EC maintains uh, a strong low off the Oregon coast. And here I have the parallel GFS uh, shown here in the same sort of pressure field. So low resolution grid, but it's showing a closed 996 contour, whereas the operation GFS did not have that. So even though the wind field is similar, it's good to see that the parallel GFS has a lower uh, cyclone off the coast. 42 hours out, GFS parallel now on the bottom right. And again, compared to the operational GFS, it is showing a 996 low, but compared to just an open 1,000 hectopascal trough in the operational GFS, so an encouraging thing. Then finally, 48 hours out, I don't show the GFS parallel anymore because it ends up being the same magnitude as operational from this point uh, outwards, but it was encouraging to see that it was at least lower um, from at 42 hours out. And then European Center at the bottom right, maintaining a low uh, surface pressure and a stronger wind field than uh, both the NAM and the GFS at this lead time. So just showing 60 hours out at this lead time, both the GFS and the EC are completely absent of any low um, off the coast. So again, just reiterating, um, low predictability for this event. I'll just quickly show just uh, the dynamics and how just little changes in vorticity at 500 millibars, which is the top two plots, leads to uh, differences forcing. So on the bottom left is just uh, Q vectors in the arrows and Q vector convergence. So where there's the warm colors is just signifying rising air and potentially a lower surface low. So this is the analysis. 
uh, four times zero is zero. The key vector plot is going to be six hours prior to uh, what I show on the top. But at this time, you see it's a negatively tilted short wave off the Oregon coast. That's associated with key vector convergence. We can get 36 hours out. This is when uh, the GFS is starting to form just more of an open trough and not a closed low. You can see that uh, the area of rising motion, the key vector convergence, shifts to the east and uh, just the trough in general becomes weaker. And so just this small change in the uh, vorticity location led to a rather large change in the, the surface. And you can see that the European Center maintains this compact vorticity feature. And then finally, 48 hours out, uh, GFS trough becomes even broader and further to the east, uh, less forcing for center and low levels. And the European Center maintains, again, that compact uh, short wave, which is very important. Um, creating that strong surface low. And then forecast hour 60, both of the troughs in GFS and EC are much too broad uh, with weak forcing for ascent. Looking at a uh, comparison between the GEPS and the GEPS X, what I have here is a 996 millibar uh, member contours, again valid at 12 to the end of August time. On the top is going to be operational GEPS, bottom parallel GEPS. Uh, you can see in the extremely short lead times, 12-hour forecast, the parallel gaps has much more spread, which theoretically is going to be good for greater uh, spread in the model at greater lead times. But as you go to longer uh, forecast lengths, especially 36 hours out, you can see that the parallel gaps actually has uh, fewer closed 996 millibar contours uh, compared to the operational GFS. So there were eight I counted in the operational and or six in operational and four in the parallel. And then moving out to 48 and 60 hours, a parallel gaps has one post contour 48 hours out, similar to operational gaps. And then the operational gaps um, has some post contour 60 hours out, whereas the parallel doesn't have any. So this is uh, for this one event, the team's operational outperforms uh, the parallel, but there was substantial uncertainty with this. And now comparing some uh, trap forecast because maybe the gaps really isn't that, that short of time range. So here's a, a mesoscale ensemble type setup. So this is going to be from the 20Z, 27th of August cycle. It's going to be 39 hour forecast. So this is the operational stress. Again, this is going to be valid at the 12Z, uh, 29th of August time. So what I just did here was went through all the members and circles. Anything that was a sub, thousand hectopascal low, a sort of subjective thing, but to get an idea of the comparison between the operational parallel. So here's just a uh, field of pressure and uh, 10 meter winds for the ARW members of the operational stress. So three members here had a sub 1,000 hectopascal low off the coast. And then again, looking at the corresponding vorticity fields, you can see those corresponded to, again, this lobe of vorticity um, off the Oregon coast. This one member seems to be more associated with the high latitude trough so getting sort of the right output for the wrong reasons. Looking at NMMB members, three of these members, again, had a surface low, so six total now, cumulative. Again, corresponding vorticity, that all-important vorticity load from off the Oregon coast, forcing those lows. And then finally, the NMM members, um, two of those had a low, so for a total of eight members out of um, all the stress had a low. And again, the vorticity features, this one member, a little different from what actually verified, but again, that member on the bottom left there had that uh, load that verified. So looking at the, the parallel stress and how this uh, ensemble did, so looking at uh, the RW members here, you see uh, just one member out of these formed a sub-1000 hectopascal low. Again, of course, on vorticity showing the same feature that forced that low. NMMB members, again, just one. The other side of ARW members, um, really no closed low. There is one member that has a significant open trough with strong winds on the southern end, but um, no closed low. And then finally, the last few NMMB members, a few of them have some weak lows off the Oregon coast, but only one of them met my sort of subjective criteria, arbitrary criteria of sub-nominal hectopascals. So a total of three members. So again, comparing this to 
decorational uh, stress uh, may be underperformed a little bit compared to that. But again, I think all of these show that it was a very uncertain event. And so to summarize, this is very low predictability. Um, it was an impactful event resulting from the reaction of two troughs over the Pacific Ocean. No deterministic model examined had a forecast for the surface low when 48 hours out. The parallel gas or the parallel GFS and parallel NAM improved upon their respective operational versions by around six hours. And then finally, both GEFs and Shrek parallel didn't really appear to improve upon forecasts for this event um, in particular. And I'll let Jeff uh, go to his presentation and we'll take any questions at the end. Right, there's a uh, picture of the uh, troubles that uh, were created in the Seattle area uh, by this storm. So these are the observed uh, gusts uh, from Cliff Mass's blog, and you can see there were gusts in the uh, 60 to uh, 70 range uh, uh, in the Puget uh, or just north of Puget Sound area. And I think it's 87 uh, at I think that's called the Destruction Harbor, Destruction Island, something like that, very uh, appropriately. Uh, these are the zoomed-in plots of the gusts in the, uh, the the Seattle area with 40 to 60 uh, uh, knots observed. And the reason this is a, uh, a case worth looking at is uh, hundreds of thousands of people lost power uh, due to this, and there were uh, uh, two fatalities from uh, uh, falling trees. So uh, the, uh, the the synoptics here, we, we've gotten the theme here that from Corey that uh, the uh, synoptic uh, predictability was uh, was limited. I'm going to blow through these uh, a little bit, but just yeah, these are 925 uh, uh, millibar um, winds from the uh, previous day, and we're going to see we want to see some indication of strong winds here in the low levels of the boundary layer that could potentially be mixed down to the surface. So the day before, the GFS was showing some 50 to 60 knots uh, at the 925 level. Uh, approaching the Seattle area. Uh, the NAM had uh, weaker wind, strong winds on the coast uh, at the 925 level, but a little bit weaker in the Seattle area. The, uh, these are the four nest runs the day before, uh, all with slightly stronger winds than the parent in the uh, Seattle area. Uh, European, um, somewhat like the, uh, the GFS. And then uh, day of, these are the four uh, forecasts. Um, and the GFS here all showing 40 to 60 knot winds at 925 in the Seattle area. NAM a little bit weaker um, in the Seattle area, stronger uh, along the coast compared to the GFS. And the NAM nest, again, noticeably uh, stronger with the winds along the coast and in the uh, Seattle area than the parent. So how does that translate into the model gust forecast? This is the day before where we're assessing the potential. These are the four NAM cycles the day before. And consistent with the synoptic errors where the NAM, as Corey said, had a weaker system, uh, you can see that the gust forecasts for the coast were in the 30 to 40, maybe 40 to 50 range. But in the Seattle area, we're in the generally 30 to 40 knots, which certainly, is, certainly indicates some kind of threat. The, uh, from the uh, nest, um, as we get closer to the event here, the uh, 18Z cycle the day before was showing 40 to 50 knot gust potential in the Seattle area with some even uh, 50 to 60 uh, just to the west. These are the, uh, the GFS. Uh, again, as we got uh, with a little bit more lead time, it was generally 30 to 40 knot gust potential, but the 18Z cycle the day before, 40 to 50 knots. And then day of, again, as the... Uh, uh, models are really catching on here uh, to the uh, synoptics. The uh, NAM is showing uh, the 12Z particular 40 to 50 knot gusts uh, potential in the Seattle area. The, uh, the NEST is showing again, 40 to 50, but also some uh, 50 to 60. And along the coast, it's really uh, going for it with 50 to 60 and 60 to 70 knot uh, gusts in the NEST. GFS not quite as strong with the gusts as the uh, uh, NAM or, or the NEST, but still a uh, certainly a, a significant event there uh, shown. These are the four HER cycles uh, on the day of the event between 10 and 13 uh, Z. So these are lead times of uh, six to nine hours. Um, 
widespread uh, 40 to 50 and quite a bit of 50 to 60, and you even see in the orange some um, 60 to 70 knot gusts uh, shown, interestingly weaker along the coast uh, for whatever reason. Um, although I think maybe the observed gusts were a little bit earlier along the coast. There's a little bit of a weakness, particularly here in the 12Z. Uh, if you look here through the uh, Puget Sound area, the wind gusts are a little bit weaker than some of the uh, areas uh, around it. We'll come back to that. These are the uh, 14 to 17 Z, so as the event is just about going, the real winds are kicking in. Again, uh, lots of uh, 40 to 50 and even some 50 to 60 and 60 to 70 knot uh, gusts uh, shown by the HER. The gust looks better than these are the max 10 meter winds. Uh, the max 10 meter wind values were generally shown in the uh, 30 to 40. Uh, uh, not, and then the 14 to 17 Z her cycle, same thing. Again, these aren't, these aren't true gusts. These are the max 10 meter winds uh, during the hour period. So you're getting a better signal of the magnitude of the threat from the gust than the max 10 meter wind field. Uh, just to show the same here from the uh, NAM nest, whereas the, uh, the gust from the NAM nests were in the, uh, we showed in the 40 to 50 range, the max 10 meter winds were generally in the 20 to 30 range in the uh, Puget Sound area. So why, are the, why were the gusts forecast so successful for this event and, and better than the max 10 meter winds? Let's look at a few forecast soundings versus OBS for Quileute, uh, Washington. Now this is by the coast, not, the, uh, not by Seattle, but this is also uh, several hours, 12G, several hours before the winds really got going in Seattle. So uh, DASH is the model, observed is the solid, NAM and GFS 12 hour forecast. And you can see in the observed, there's a pretty strong, deep mixed layer here. Uh, it's it's uh, inversion right at the surface, so we're not uh, going to realize that. But this is, you know, 5 in the morning there. But you can see with this uh, strong mixed layer in place, that shows the potential for strong winds to be mixed to the surface. The, uh, the models didn't uh, pick up on that very well for Quileute, but that's because they've, uh, they're producing rain at this time, so we wouldn't expect to see a mixed PBL. Uh, same here with the uh, uh, NAM nest and the RAP. None of them for Quileute had that uh, mixed layer, although the uh, nest was at least a little bit uh, towards in that direction. But if we look at forecast uh, for Seattle, six-hour forecast for Seattle around the time of the max winds, here's the RAP and the HER, and they both do show a, that nice mixed layer that we don't have an observed sounding for Seattle. Um, but we can, we can, given what happened, given what we saw in the Quileute observation and what we know that we had very strong winds at the surface, it's a good bet that this mixed layer did exist. And the RAP and the HER both show a, uh, a nice mixed layer with very strong winds in the boundary layer that could potentially be mixed down. Here's, excuse me, here's the same for the NAM and the NAM nest, same thing. Uh, all, um, all guidance has a... Uh, uh, strong uh, mixed layer, and uh, even if you go back to uh, 42 hours uh, back, the NAM, the uh, NAM nest, and the GFS all had that Seattle on Saturday would have a strong mixed layer in place with uh, pretty healthy momentum in the boundary layer to potentially get mixed down. And pretty much all the cycles, once the, uh, the model started picking up on the idea that this trough was going to be stronger and swing inland. They all showed this scenario, again, of, of a strong mixed layer and strong momentum in the boundary layer to be mixed down. Um, and if you go back uh, the 42 hours, now here's the NAM and the NAM nest. The, here they, they both show the uh, mixed layer, but it, it, at longer time ranges where we showed the NAM had trouble with the uh, uh, overall synoptic setup, you can see its winds here within the boundary layer are overall weaker. It's only 35 knots max here at the top of the PBL, which we know was, was well underdone. But the uh, NAM nest was considerably stronger in the, uh, in the boundary layer. So consistently, the uh, nest was producing stronger winds uh, in the boundary layer and then at the surface. Again, the, uh, we showed that the, for some of the HER cycles, particularly here the 12Z, while it overall shows a high threat of wind gusts here around Seattle, there's a little bit of a min here um, through the uh, uh, Puget Sound area. And if you look at the forecasted profile here uh, from this HER run, um, 
It's got the temperatures uh, uh, dropping off uh, with height. So uh, it supplies a pretty decent mixed PBL up to around maybe 867 with up to 63 knots at the top of the PBL that could mix, be mixed down. So why are we seeing uh, a weaker uh, gust field? Well, again, there's the, uh, the gust. This is the uh, forecast PBL height by the, uh, the HER, and it shows a very shallow um, PBL right here in this red uh, in the uh, Puget Sound area, and that kind of lines up for the most part with where we have the weaker gust. So even though the forecast sounding uh, looked like it would uh, support, and this is the forecast, this looks like it would support here. It looks like your PBL goes up to about you know, 867 or so, or, which is uh, over 1,000 uh, meters above the ground. For whatever reason, the, uh, the PBL uh, 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 from uh, forecast by the model was low, so the gust algorithm wasn't able to quite mix uh, the momentum down. The, the gust algorithm keys off how high the PBL height is and then mixes down a percentage of the excess momentum uh, within the boundary layer to the surface. But still, despite that, again, pretty good indication here that there is a significant threat of uh, some very strong damaging gusts. So again, the, uh, much like uh, with the, uh, the predictability of the uh, sea level pressure and such being limited, that translates to a limited predictability of the threat of damaging gusts. But once the model is caught on to the overall uh, details of the system, the timing, the strength, and the track, the forecast all showed strong winds in the PBL. And then the uh, gust algorithms did a nice job mixing that down to the ground because the models overall did a good job showing that mixed layer in place to bring that uh, momentum to the surface. Overall, the high-res guidance was uh, best in showing the strong uh, wind fields. And the, uh, in terms of assessing the threat, the gust forecasts uh, were better uh, than the uh, max 10-meter wind fields from the uh, high-res guidance. So with that, I'll uh, take any uh, comments or questions. Brad. The gust forecasts are going to have a tendency to produce higher amounts than the max 10 meter wind because they're like a potential almost. Right, absolutely. And you see this with severe weather. Yeah, and, and this is more not a failing of the max 10 meter wind. It's just for forecasters in terms of what to look at. Yeah. The max 10 meter wind you know, might, might be better out of maybe convective systems, but for more widespread wind fields, the gust still has relevance, I think, is, is the point there. And we see it systematic where, where the gust tends to also predict larger areas. Sure. Yeah, I mean, essentially, if, you, right, if, you've, got, uh, if you've got mixing, if, you, if you've got a mixed layer and strong momentum in that, it's going to automatically bring some down to the surface. The gust come out of the post-processing? It does. Again, it, it, it keys off the PBL height. And it looks for looks what the wind speed is within the PBL, and looks for like the maximum excess in the PBL compared to the surface, and it brings down a certain percentage of that that's weighted on how high above the ground you are. Okay. The difference between the two is just the same difference between a gust and a wind. Yes. The should be higher. They should be. I'm wondering if there's an issue with mixing down of the elevated mixed layer after it comes over the Olympics. And that's one of the reasons the higher rate sometimes have trouble if the hurricane have trouble getting it down to higher. I don't know. Yeah, except that. Yeah, sure. I, I think my point was that the, the sounding here looked like, you know, it looks like you should have the, the PBL to me based on this is, you know, is up here, and that's for Seattle. And the PBL height here, it's, it's for, although, although it's for the Seattle airport, I don't, is, Brad, is that a little bit, is that in the green here? You, you know that area a little bit better. The airport, that's, that's oh, I'm sorry, yeah, we're, we're up in here somewhere. So, so yeah, so I don't, I don't, the question is there, why did the model diagnostic PBL say a very low PBL height when the sounding suggests otherwise? It's a, a, a minor issue that's... Uh, that was noted. Again, overall, I think the forecasts were pretty good showing the gust threat. So. Uh, I'm just throwing things out there. For sure, sure, always welcome. Very complex terrain. Absolutely. Yeah, this is Curtis. Uh, thanks for the fascinating presentation on the winds. I think um, one other thing I would suggest perhaps looking at is the 80-meter wind values. Uh, we've often suggested that um, 
perhaps forecasters consider looking at that as another measure of the uh, wind potential, especially when you know the situation may support significant vertical momentum transport. And that 80 meter level tends to get above the issue of, you know, approximations of surface roughness and everything that could augment the 10 meter values. Do, 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 I mean, like use it in concert with the gust field? Is that what Absolutely. you recommend? Yeah. Thanks. A any thoughts on the uh, PBL uh, there being shown as kind of low? Um, I think what you have is, yes, again, a, an extremely shallow layer over the water that's, uh, you know, temperature-wise, that's forcing a slight, my guess is if, uh, you know, a very slight stable layer near the surface. I'm wondering if you zoom in far enough on that sounding right near the, the surface layer, if you can see a little kink in the, the temperature field. I just don't know. I mean, obviously, you see well, some signal. Go ahead, Jeff. I'm sorry. I, I've got up now the uh, printout of what the uh, her sounding was, and maybe right there in that lowest level, because the temperature's not really uh, uh, decreasing with height, right in that lowest layer. Maybe it's picking up that as the top of the PBL. Yeah, I think it's tripping on a very shallow layer near the surface that it thinks is the top of the PBL in the gust diagnostic. Yeah. It's using a theta v based calculation, I think, for figuring out where the yeah. top of the PBL is. So. It's possible that if you look at that profile in the vertical state of E, that if you have a you know increase in height with that, it, right off the deck, it might think that there's a PBL height that's uh, spuriously low there. Okay, that, that that must be it there, where that that because you're only you're you're essentially the same temperature there in that first uh, between the first and second layer. That as you say, that must be just barely tripping the uh, threshold for end of the uh, you know. Yeah, we have a check, I thought, in the, in the diagnostic to prevent something like this from happening, but I'd have to see what the thresholds are, and maybe this is just slipping past that. Yeah, I mean, it uses the LPBL, which comes in from, I, I didn't check to see exactly where that comes in from. We can take a quick look at that later. It's uh, not critical, but uh, th thank you for your thoughts about, and we'll, uh, I, I might plot up the 80-meter wind from this case just to see what it yeah. looks like. Yep. Also, Corey noted that the uh, gusts from the European were stronger than from our model, so I maybe need to make a plot of that, too. We, we're, not, we're not too familiar with what algorithm they use, but uh, right. that may be worth a look at. Uh, we have to well. correct, I mean, getting really into the weeds here, too, the, the gust diagnostic in the herd is because you know, we add that momentum excess onto a base value, and that base value can either be the 10-meter um, diagnosed value for coming out of the model or lowest model level, depending on how the model is configured and what the height of the lowest model level actually is. And for the her and the wrap, the height of the lowest model level actually ends up being slightly below 10 meters. So the mo lowest model level is actually a better base value upon which to add the momentum excess. Interesting. All right. Th thank you. And yep. Very, you know, the diagnostic is also have issues because might not be completely determined by the local because it is such energy in this No doubt. So, not a point that's over that nice, you know, 55 degree water. <laughs> it's going to look, look a lot different than what the actual yeah. looks like. All right. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thanks, Jeff.